or due to pain or due to temperature. So you have to check the temperature, make sure that she's not in pain and she's not dehydrated. Once you give the fluids, pain relief, then the heart rate will come back to normal. Now, same way, moderate baseline bradycardia, there is a range called moderate baseline tachycardia, 160 to 180, provided there are accelerations and good variability, that baby is doing well. There's nothing to worry because the somatic and the autonomic nervous system is doing well. And with the contractions here at the bottom, there are no decelerations. So in other words, there is no decelerations to cause any hypoxia. So the next lesson is hypoxia is unlikely without decelerations in labor. So if we don't see decelerations and the heart rate is going up, it is either due to pain or fever or some other problem setting in. This one is very obviously due to infection. As you could see, the mother has a temperature of 39.8, the maternal pulse is 112, and the heart rate is 220. But we know this is not due to hypoxia because with the contractions here at the bottom, there are no corresponding decelerations. In other words, this tachycardia is due to infection. Obviously, this cannot be managed by doing a pH because babies with infection can suddenly collapse and die. So pH is not an answer to monitor uh, infected babies. So that's a summary of the baseline heart rate. 100 to 110 is moderate baseline. 160 to 180 is moderate baseline tachy. And tachycardia is common in the preterm, but can happen at term. And no evidence of hypoxia if there are no abnormal features and the CTG is reactive. Now the maternal heart rate can give rise to same features like the fetal heart rate. So here we are used an MECG, maternal ECG, by putting chest leads and it is showing accelerations and variability similar to the baby's heart rate. So in the UK, the medical devices agency has said before you apply a uh, transducer to monitor the baby, you must use a stethoscope or a dop tone to make sure that you are recording the baby and not the mother. Because if you use a fetal stethoscope, you won't misinterpret a maternal vessel. You can't hear the maternal vessel pulsation. Whereas if you put an ultrasound transducer, it'll pick up the maternal vessel like a heartbeat. If you use a dop tone, it has two sounds. The blood vessel will give you a shoeful, shh, shh, like that. You know, you have seen in the early pregnancy. Whereas the heartbeat, it'll give you tap, 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 tap. So using a dop tone is better to locate the fetal heart rate or a stethoscope compared to using a transducer, which is because every single baby in the labor will look the same. So be careful of not getting trapped. And sometimes the ultrasound transducer can slip if you put too much jelly and you can latch on to the maternal pulse to 110. So if you don't notice it, then you might continue monitoring, <laughs> thinking this is the baby. So always check back on your recording to say there's no sudden change in the heart rate pattern. Now, I mentioned to you when the baby moves a lot, sometimes it confuses what's the baseline rate. So this is actually, Pearson from Cardiff used to call it pseudo distress pattern because he used to get informed the heart rate is 160 with late decelerations, and the babies are born in good condition. What they have done is actually misinterpret, this is the baseline, and these are accelerations. And these prolonged accelerations are generally with confluent fetal movements, a number of fetal movements, then you get these accelerations. So this baby is doing well. So whenever you get a confusing pattern, you look at the mother's tummy, you can see the baby moving, or you can feel, the baby is moving, that is fine. This is at a ward round at 10 o'clock when I was doing, this is a trace, they were getting worried, getting ready to do a cesarean section on a 37 week with some mild preeclampsia. And I said, there's nothing to worry because I could see the baby moving. And the baby must have heard me and settled down nicely. So the baby has nothing, no problem here. So the babies that move are not hypoxic. So please, in antenatal period and in early labor and also up to mid labor, also check for fetal movement. Here this is an antenatal phrase, they were worried about variability and decelerations, but the mother is using an event marker button and saying there are plenty of fetal movements. So the baby runs, 
heart rate goes up, slows down, it comes down. So baby is moving is a good sign. Now you might hear stories that there were agonal fetal movements and the baby died the next day. That happens, rare, 20 to 40,000 births, one will happen. So if a mother rings you and says, I'm worried the baby was moving a lot, I don't know what is happening, the only question you have to ask her is, how is the baby doing now? If she says the baby is moving now, then that is nothing to worry. The way mother says the baby moved a lot yesterday, but is not moving now, that's the one you have to be concerned about. If you get two heart rate, what happens? One, the baby is dead. If the baby is dead, the ultrasound picks up the maternal vessels and doubles it up. So if you put a stethoscope, you can't hear anything. If it ultrasound picks the aortic pulsations, and also the iliac pulsations together, it'll give you double the heart rate. So that is one possibility. The second is when there is bradycardia. The heart rate goes as tapped up, tapped up, tapped up, and in the machine there is something called electronic window. So the first tap and the second tap goes to the next window, and the first sound of the next comes into the same window, it'll count it as two. So when you hear, you will hear tap, 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 Top, not top, 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 top. So the sounds are so different. So bradycardia is the second reason you get double heart sounds. And this is actually common with second stage of labor when there are too many contractions. The baby has a bradycardia, but the machine gives you two rates. And people confuse this as this is fetal and this is maternal, but really, both are fetal, one is the, the lower one is the actual rate and the upper one. The third is the mother has SLE, so the transducer picks up the atrial pulsation separately from the ventricular pulsations, but the rates might not be exactly double, and you might have to do a scan to find out. Now in rare circumstances, the baby's heart rate can be well below 100. This is direct ECG, so the mother has a scalp electrode, and this is on a mother who had renal transplant whose blood pressure could not be controlled other than beta blocking drugs, which are contraindicated in pregnancy. But she's able to increase the heart rate, so we said she can give birth because the kidneys are usually transplanted in the false pelvis. So she managed, to, she's a gravidat three, so she managed to deliver very quickly. So we have looked at some problems with accelerations and the baseline rate. So I'm going to talk a little bit about baseline variability. What are the difficulties? The reduced variability is a worry, and that can be physiological due to fetal behavioral cycles. Hypoxia can give rise to reduced variability. Medication like pethidine, Valium, recreational drugs can give rise to variability. As well as dexamethasone, betamethasone. Prematurity, as I mentioned, the parasympathetic is not matured to mature the baby's lungs. And uh, tachycardia, when the machine pumps at a rate more than 180, the machine finds it difficult to give rise to good variability. And uh, cerebral hemorrhage, when the baby has bleeding in the brain, it can't give rise to much variability. And fetal malformations, Mainly brain malformations can give rise to variability, reduce variability and anesthesia because the anesthetic drug crosses the blood-brain barrier and gets deposited. The blood-brain barrier in the baby is formed fully at the end of one year of life. That's why when the baby gets jaundice, we give phototherapy, otherwise the bile pigments will give rise to connectors by crossing. So if I have an anesthetic drug given for a mother at 32 weeks for a fractured leg, if she comes back to the ward, for the next 24 to 36 hours, she will have reduced variability. You don't have to worry about that. We do a lot of mitral and tricuspid valve replacement for mothers at St. George's. We look for it as the moment the anesthesia goes, the heart rate becomes reduced variability. We don't have to worry. The heart rate goes up, the mother needs more blood and oxygen. If it falls suddenly, then we have to intervene. So reduce variability can be due to anesthesia as well. So we'll have a few examples. Now, after 35 weeks, the baby has what we call as a behavioral state, one to four, but one and two and three and four can be combined, one and two into what we call as an active and a quiet epoch. So the baby 
tosses the ball, plays, goes to sleep, tosses the ball, goes to sleep. Each baby has a certain limit, like many of us have an alarm clock. We go to bed at 11 and get up at 6 or go to bed at 12 and get up at 5. That's our alarm clock. The same happens to the baby as a behavioral state. I can see some of you are sleeping already, so that's your alarm clock, so I can't help that part. Now, when you monitor the baby, you have to write two things in the notes. Number one, reactive. Reactive means two accelerations in a 15 minutes window, that means the baby is not hypoxic acidotic. The second thing I want you to write is cycling, CTG is cycling. Cycling means active followed by a quiet, active followed by a quiet. If the baby's brain is damaged already due to some bleeding inside or some malformation, it might show accelerations but they'll be sporadic, not an active and a quiet, not an active and a quiet epoch. I'll just give you a story. Many years ago, Dr. Tani Chan, who is a very senior obstetrician, rang me very frantically from Singapore. She did a vacuum delivery. The baby was born in reasonable condition, but within six hours started fitting. And they thought it is due to infection. They did a lumbar puncture and there was blood stained CSF. They said, ah, because you did the vacuum delivery, you have caused bleeding in the brain. And they did an x-ray, no fracture, nothing. So she said, no, I didn't do anything wrong. 